Well, thank you for agreeing to come on the channel and be interviewed about this poem. It really is a fantastic poem. I love it. And I'd love to start by asking what inspired you to write it? OK, well, um, I, I have um, a young composer, musician to thank, a young woman called Gemma Wilde. She's probably not a young woman anymore, but um, <clears throat> um, she I'd done some work with her in the past and um, she'd been asked to um, to do a piece of work for Leeds Architecture Week. And um, she likes the idea of composing a piece. She played saxophone herself and composing a piece for saxophone and having uh, a poet read a poem over, over that. Um, and um, so she approached me and said, are you interested? Uh, so um, of course, yeah, I was born in Leeds. So obviously that, you know was a a hook for me but I also had really enjoyed working with her and uh, I just thought yeah that'd be a great idea so I had no idea what I was going to do um, and um, I did some research I think she may have mentioned this uh, site in Leeds near the canal uh, called Tower Works and it was basically the site of what had been an old engineering works in Leeds and um, in the 1800s and uh, there are three towers in this on this site that look like they could be in Italy um, particularly one of them looks very much like Giotto's tower uh, in Italy one of his towers in Italy so um, so I went round to, to sort of just wandered around really I kind of you know got off the train walked down the canal found it's quite near the canal in Leeds and um, and found the site, but I couldn't. I couldn't actually get into the site because it, it's all been redeveloped and uh, and it was all locked up. But um, so I stood on the canal and could see the towers from there, um, and um, made some notes about it. You know, uh, Leeds has got those. What I remember from being younger, the dark arches underneath the railway station, and uh, so. Uh, that was part of the process and the other thing about it was that I decided to do some research into a bit more research into my family history um, particularly uh, well obviously on my mother's side uh, my mum was from Yorkshire and um, so I, I kind of did some research I've got a lot of the I've got I'm, I'm a bit of a family archivist really so I've got lots of like birth certificates and marriage certificates from various ancestors and I I researched and discovered that a, one of my great-great-grandfathers would have worked in the um, flax uh, mill uh, um, so that was like another exciting thing in a way because suddenly it wasn't you know just me coming into it it was like there was there was somebody else in the picture and I suppose that's how it developed really I I was interested in the buildings obviously so I just began to I mean I think I'd started off with a kind of sense of well maybe maybe this happened you know maybe he was in that factory and maybe he you know all of that kind of thing um and as it developed <laughs> the maybe went out of it really because um you know it became what it was uh yeah so and then we performed it actually um uh in the music college uh and she'd written it for three saxophones i think three yeah so there were three mm -hmm. musicians playing and and me reading the poem and uh, it was great actually um oh. which is thought of why i know it very well the poem you know <clears throat> so yeah. did did you write it and then she composed afterwards or was it sort of at, at the same time um i wrote it and sent it to her and yeah. she composed around it yeah yeah wow i thought that uh i didn't expect an answer like that that's so <laughs> i know it's quite yeah. a story isn't it really yeah, it's yeah. Great. It's yeah, great. yeah yeah um so I know these kinds of questions are the kinds of questions students want the answers to, but I know they can be frustrating to, yeah. uh, to poets, writers, that kind of thing. But the dreams the great granddad has and the or the great great granddad has and the wider view he took, which, of course, is the title 
Um, and then, of course, the significance of the ringing bells. So, so what, you know, if you don't want to give away too much, but what, what is all of that about, ultimately? Yeah, well, I don't think it is about giving away, actually, because I think, um, I think the way I feel about poetry and children reading poetry for exams, uh, and, I, and I kind of say this whenever I go into schools, is the first and most important thing is to read the poem and enjoy it for what it is and for what it says to you, regardless of why I wrote it. But what what does it sound like to you? What do you hear in it? What does it spark off for you? You know, does it relate to anything in your family? Anything like that. Um, and I think sometimes, unfortunately, because a lot, you know, maybe because a lot of the children are focused on, oh, I must get this. They miss that first thing out. And and um, so that would be my first thing to say, really. In a way, it doesn't matter what I meant by it. Uh, what matters is what you hear in it, really. Um, and, um, and what it moves you to do or think about or go and research for yourself or whatever. You know, like if it makes a... A, a, a child, a young person think, well, I wonder what Temple Mill is. I wonder what Marshall's Temple Mill is. Oh, I'm going to go and look that up. You know, I'm going to go Google that and see what happened there. Or I'm wondering what flax, you know, combing flax was all about, you know. Um, and then, so in terms of what it means to me, um, I think where it took me, I think when I start writing a poem, I don't have an idea, oh, I'm going to do this and it's because of this. I sort of start on a bit of a journey and and it takes me somewhere. So when I discovered my great great grandfather in Temple Mill, which was where the flax was prepared, um, and I'd found out I knew that he was somebody who combed flax. And I also knew from looking at pictures that that the mill would have been very noisy. Not well, from looking at pictures, I knew that there would have been very little light in there. Um, because the, the light came down sort of through, it had a flat roof, a green roof, in fact. And a very interesting fact that I found out was that it had a green roof and they used to graze sheep on it to keep the, the yeah, the, the greenery down. Um, um, but, um, but there were these like conical, basically these circular light uh, windows that sent shafts of light. So... When I thought, I thought about the noise in the place and the fact that there was very little light and the dust and getting in your eyes. So it all felt very enclosed and claustrophobic and, yeah, not a very pleasant place to work and the hours that they used to work. So then when, when I imagined him walking home uh, and passing the towers... I suppose the idea of him walking home was because, I mean, I, I know this, if I've been doing a lot of close work, then I want to go out and have a walk and, and look, have a wider view. I want to look to her across the horizon and and rest my eyes from that close work. So I guess I was just imagining that that, that would be a reason for him to take that journey, really. and taking a long way home because he wants the fresh well he wants the air it's not necessarily fresh in those days um, <laughs> but he wants the he wants the kind of the chance to look up I guess and and um and have that wider view and I realize that 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 also has another significance because it does it does have an echo of then a wider view in terms of is there more than this to life yeah I guess that that comes into it really um and the, and so when I imagine him walking past there um and seeing a tower that might have had bells in it I guess that's just expanding that view a little more so you know com contrasting between the engines and the looms and the shuttles something that is just so much so much lighter a sound and so much more about um yeah reaching you know it's more up than down really it's more kind of reaching out to the sky um 
Uh, so yeah, that that I think, and yeah. and I've no idea what his dreams were really. In a way, I just imagine, which is what I think would be a really good thing for anyone studying this poem to do is to think is to imagine what might his his dreams have been. You know, uh, yeah. I, I can only guess, just like anybody else, really. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. It's interesting with the the sort of industrial setting because. Um, so this poem is in part of the Worlds and Lives cluster from AQA. Yeah. And one of the things the exam board said, which I thought was really interesting, is that the um, the modern poems are rooted in the revolutionary spirit of the Romantics. Yes. Well, as you described it, um, I realised that it does fit in with it. Um, but I think I didn't... I mean, I've explained to you how I began the poem. So I didn't set out with a mission of, uh, I'm going to write a poem that illustrates the love of nature and a criticism of the of industry, industrialization and the harsh conditions of the workers and all of that. I didn't set out to write a poem because I very rarely set out to, with a mission about what a poem is going to be. I might have an idea, but the poem does its own thing really and um, so I set out to write a poem about buildings in Leeds and the poem did its own thing really and told me this story um, and um, so yes my poem it came from personal experience literally being in the place and then looking back but as soon as I began to look back uh, you know I, I have a very strong kind of identity I guess as a part part of my identity is very strongly rooted in a kind of working class history in Leeds so to find out the actual conditions that some of my ancestors work, worked in then I uh, I feel yeah critical of that and I want to I want to not say in the poem that I'm critical I just want to show people in the poem this is what this is what it was like. Yeah, uh, you, you make your own decisions about it, really. Which is, which is what the best revolutionary poems do, don't they? The, the best, yeah. Rev the difference between a revolutionary speech and a revolutionary poem for me is that a revolutionary speech is very much kind of is very much more didactic, whereas a, a revolutionary poem is is presenting something and. Uh, hoping that people will be moved by it to want change. Yeah. So it's a little bit about, for me, I always feel about it's a bit more like changing hearts as well as minds. Yeah, and, and something that's interesting is this isn't just a poem that says, let's look at what life was like, you know, um, back then for my, uh, for this generation in, in Leeds. It brings it to the present then. And this, you know, the last two stands is, a, you know, the uh, my footsteps today. It brings it up to today. And there, there seems to be this, this sort of theme about belonging by connecting the past and the present. Mm -hmm. So in terms of belonging, what does the poem tell us? It probably tells you something about my, um, uh, my feelings about the whole issue of belonging. Um, gr growing up, in Leeds in the 1950s, in a mixed heritage family, uh, the question of belonging was very present, really. Um, like, where where do we belong? Um, we we belonged very, very, um, very much in my mum's extended family. We were very. Um, it, to me it feels like a big contrast in a way to a lot of the narrative that's happening at the moment about migrants and uh, refugees my, my you know my father was welcomed into their family um they were a kind of welcome all comers kind of family you know um um my auntie used to say it was like our house had rubber walls because anybody who was around was welcomed in and there was always food for anybody who arrived. And um, in that spirit, my dad was very much welcomed as part of the family. And even though some people were critical, 
you know, people knocking on my grandmother's door and saying, I've seen your daughter in town with a black man. She would just say, yes, I know. And uh, he's in my front room now having a cup of tea, you know, what's your problem sort of thing. So she was very fortunate to have parents like that. And, um, and then I was fortunate to be a child in that family because for me growing up, that was that family, I suppose, sheltered us from the kind of prejudice that might have been around that 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 grew as well over the years. I, I would imagine, you know, in terms of what was happening in the country. Um, so belonging <clears throat> became more of a. So there I was in that family, rooted in that family in some way, but there was always this other this other family that was in. Ceylon, as it was then called, and then Sri Lanka, um, which was a sort of uh, a very romantic thing for me. It was very much a heart place for me. Um, pictures and letters from over there and tea sent over there from relatives over there. So um, even though I've never lived there, uh, I sort of feel like I belong there a little as well. Um, and then as you're growing up, you realise that there are places where you belong and then you don't belong, or you might belong because you've got the right accent. Like if I speak with a Yorkshire accent, it makes me belong in Yorkshire, but when people see me, it makes them think I don't belong. Um, so there's that sort of dilemma all the time, really, about you just feel like you're a person fitting in with things and then you realize that other people are seeing you in a different way so for me that's what belonging is all about it's kind of it's it's um it's a very mixed bag i can't say when i'm in this place i feel really um at home yeah. i don't i don't often say that and and some people i know do do that you know when i go back to the place i was born i feel at home and I, I, I think for me, uh, home, home is more disparate, really. I think, and in it, and it's not just in the present. So that connection with the past is very important. That connection with why our families came together, and then the connect, the the questions and the stories about the past of both families is part of who I am now, really. And I sort of, I feel like I carry that with me uh, all the time. So that was the sense of the poem, I guess, of um, this past and the future and all being there all at once. That, you know, they're always there. I don't, it, yeah. Um, so it would be great. Would you be able to read the poem for us? That would I be. Would, yes. A wider view. From the backyard of his back to back, my great great granddad searched for spaces in the smoke filled sky to stack his dreams high enough above the cholera to keep them and his newborn safe from harm. In 1869, eyes dry with dust from 12 hours combing flax beneath the conicals of light in Marshall's Temple Mill. He took the long way home because he craved the comfort of a wider view. As he passed the panel gates of Tower Works, the tall octagonal crown of Harding's chimney drew his sights beyond the limits of his working life, drowned the din of engines, looms and shuttles with imagined peals of ringing bells. Today, my footsteps echo in the sodium gloom of Neville Street's dark arches, and the red brick vaults begin to moan as time, collapsing in the river air, sweeps me out to meet him on the wharf. We stand now, timeless in the flux of time, anchored only by the axis of our gaze, a ventilation shaft with gilded tiles and Giotto's geometric lines, while the curve of past and future generations 
arcs between us. Uh, thank you so much for this. That's um, absolutely fascinating. And that will be really useful. 